So, how to see what isn't there. I want to begin with a movie that came out just over 30 years ago in 1993, and it's one that I'm sure, I hope, is familiar to most of us in this room today. It was called Jurassic Park, and directed by Steven Spielberg, featuring actors including Jeff Goldblum, Laura Dern, Sam Neill, and Richard Attenborough. But the actors weren't really the main attraction. The story of Jurassic Park is that scientists have managed to regenerate dinosaurs from preserved DNA, and then, together with some overexcited industrialists, build an amusement park filled with these dinosaurs. These were the star of the show. There was the Tyrannosaurus Rex, of course, the flocks of Gallimimus, and maybe most of all, actually, the vicious and brilliant velociraptors who were able to systematically test the electric fence which surrounded them for weak spots. Some people come to visit for the weekend. We have paleontologists, we have a chaos theorist, we have child nerds, we have a lawyer, and of course, everything goes horribly wrong. It's brilliant. Um, I saw it in my early teens, and I loved it. I was scared stupid. And that was a really good age to watch it. Several years previously, I'd seen another kind of fantasy horror film at the cinema, Return to Oz, which is also set in a world of strange creatures and monsters. And at the end of that film, I would have been around seven or eight, at the end, I fully expected all of the actors and the monsters to come out from behind the screen and take their bow. But by the time Jurassic Park came out, I was older, and I knew what was on the screen was staying on the screen. There were no velociraptors escaping from the Odeon cinemas in Warwickshire in 1993. But there was still a question about what I was seeing and how it got there and the relationship between those two things. Dinosaurs, as you're probably aware, are not around anymore. And like other imaginary or extinct or dangerous creatures like aliens or giant sandworms, you can't simply find one, get it signed up with an actor's guild, stick it on an extra large soundstage and point a camera at it. Instead, together with a special effects team, a filmmaker has to make what isn't there there. And more than that, they have to convince the audience of the creature's presence and reality, whilst also working with their knowledge that this creature is not real. It is a tough line to walk. So today, I want to talk to you about this unsettling feeling. This uncertain relationship between what we experience and what is happening, and the relationship between the two. And I want to do this through two stories that fit together. One is relevant to Jurassic Park's own story of technological hubris and misplaced faith in scientific authority. It is a story of the times we live in, which are increasingly filled with large, convoluted, and extraordinarily powerful technological megastructures which underpin the world, and the worlds that we live in. This story is one of trying to make sense of what on earth is going on when our lives are threaded through by ever-present and increasingly controlling digital systems. At its core, it is a tale of uncertainty and destabilization, of what Madhumita Merger, the AI editor of London's Financial Times, describes as a widespread wobbly feeling of the ground shifting beneath our feet, a period of exponential change and extreme uncertainty. The other tale is the filming of Jurassic Park. After seeing the film, my parents gave me two books, the original novel by Michael Crichton and The Making of Jurassic Park, which has a little bit on the script and casting and so on, but which mostly about the special effects, the animatronics, the puppets, and of course, the CGI. A three-act story structure is a useful way to tell a story of setup, confrontation, and resolution. It can guide a complicated story through a familiar mechanism, and so that's what we're going to do. Act one establishes the main characters and their context, and later, an inciting incident will mean that life will never be the same again. The book of Jurassic Park was published in 1990 by Michael Crichton. Crichton was a writer, a screenwriter and director, and also a former doctor. He specialized in the techno-thriller. His works include The Andromeda Strain, Coma, and the original Westworld, 
And very broadly, they all explore humanity's hubris in thinking that they can use science or technology as a form of complete control. His storytelling involves a lot of technical detail, and the plot itself often turns on a misunderstanding or a misapprehension about how someone thinks a scientific or technical system is working and how much control they have over it. It's a genre, a genre that owes a lot to the fears and failures of cybernetics. Cybernetics is the science of governance of the living world, developed in the 1940s for wartime R&D. And it is a technocratic approach, which assumes that everything can be treated as an information system and then technically mapped, modelled, designed and controlled from the top. As the artist and scholar Tiger Brain tells us, to talk of systems implies the presence of an engineer. The philosopher N. Catherine Hales describes how embodiment bodies were systematically downplayed in cybernetics. And this began with the initial conceptualization of humans as only informa information processing machines, and then later treating digital, artificially intelligent creations as life because they were made of code. So Jurassic Park hits these beats. There is a lot a lot of technical and biotechnical detail about genetic code and protein engineering and the terrible consequences as the scientists who expect that because they have designed the dinosaurs and the park from top to tail, they have full control of the situation because they have engineered it all to work. To turn Jurassic Park into a film involves making dinosaurs, and although the movie is now known for really kick-starting widespread CGI in Hollywood, this was not the original plan. Instead, Spielberg intended to fill the film with puppets, animatronics, and models. So the easiest approach would have been to use miniatures to show the full movement of an entire dinosaur. So, for example, you could see an entire velociraptor running around a kitchen chasing a child, or an entire T-Rex escaping from a paddock. And you can do this with this type of stop-frame animation, which Industrial Light and Magic, ILM, had pioneered. For this, you create the animation with little models, shoot the actors separately, and then patch it together. Spielberg had other ideas. He apparently wanted to have as much full scale as he could pull off so that he could convey what it was like to be in the same time and space as the dinosaur. To have something there on the set was important. That was going to be the power of the film, to see how well the dinosaurs came across as something you had never seen before. So the full-scale dinosaurs were important for the audience to see, but they were also important for the actors to experience on set. Laura Dern, who plays Dr. Ellie Sattler, described how, when I saw the Triceratops, I couldn't believe it. Neither could Sam Neill. We were both freaking out. We laid ourselves over the belly and felt it moving in and out. And this idea of being both emotionally and physically affected by the presence of what's actually around us could be seen as a phenomenological approach in which we build our own meaning of the world based on our own subjective experiences, which are often embodied of our body. We feel them, which in this case means spooning with a gigantic animatronic triceratops. But someone had to build those dinosaurs, and that job was given to the Stan Winston studio. They had already built successfully the 15-foot-high mechanoid alien queen in the film Aliens. And so Spielberg reckoned it would be relatively straightforward to make a full-scale robot T-Rex which could independently move and walk and run and love. And a Stan Winston, apparently, did nothing to discourage that notion, even though he knew full well that the technology needed to make a massive upright dinosaur would be rather different from the rather spindly alien queen. Laugh, if you will, but how many of us in this room have said yes to a client or a curator about taking on a big project when you haven't really known how you're going to deliver it? <laughs> it wouldn't be called dinosaur robotics if we knew what we were doing. Anyway, if you run a studio which works with wood or metal or plastic or clay or fabric, um, you know that working with physical material can be extremely difficult. It's part of what the architecture scholar Brian Boyer describes as the matter battle, where the specific qualities of matter, like heaviness and largeness, exert their own power relations on the people who work with it. And this is also part of the cybernetic leg legacy which influenced Michael Crichton's work. One of the reasons, one of the many reasons, why the initial period of cybernetics failed was that it didn't or couldn't take into account the fact that not every part of the messy reality of life 
can be treated as an information system or controlled by as a pattern language. As N. Catherine Hales writes, an abstract pattern can never fully embody the actual world. Working with matter is difficult because it requires a specific sensitivity which attends to and understands its complexities. She says, anyone who works with embodied forms from the, vastly simple, from the relatively simple architecture of robotics to the vastly more complicated workings of the human neural system knows that it is by no means trivial to deal with the resistant materialities of embodiment. And you can see this with the building of the T-Rex. Because of the size of the thing, it was 20 foot high, 40 foot long, and weighed around four and a half tons, the movement of the T-Rex had to be separated into two parts, and the second upper body was also built for finer movement. The top part was built onto a custom flight simulator, and this is a machine which is used to taking big, heavy objects and moving them around smoothly with force and strength. And they could do this because the Winston Studio had hired an engineering expert who had already worked on large amusement park rides, um, and so he was a problem solver for the team. He had the expertise to know how large-scale hydraulics interacted with computer systems and then knew how to talk about flight simulators to the manufacturers who would make it. None of this was easy. The scene with the T-Rex was shot on one of the world's biggest sound stages available, and even then, the team had to design a whole new type of air-bearing floor to cope with the force generated with the t by the T-Rex as it moved. Matter is resistant. It is difficult to work with. And this scene, which is the first time we see the entire T-Rex as she escapes the paddock to freedom, this was shot in heavy rain, under a rain machine, with actual water, and the skin is made of foam rubber, which is extremely absorbent, sucking in the water, which disrupted its eternal mechanisms. And so, between takes, the T-Rex needed to be gently toweled down and dried off overnight. And at this point, you may be thinking, maybe cybernetics had it right. Maybe it would be better to take a step back from the matter and, and approach everything as information, to forget everything getting wet, under the rain machines and just make it all out of code. And there is something very tempting about treating the world as something which will just behave if you can program it that way. I imagine that if you're part of the unit which shot the famous Velociraptors in the kitchen scene, this thought may have crossed your mind. On, scene, we, on, on screen, we see two kids being terrorized by two raptors in a huge empty metallic kitchen. But on set, the Velociraptors were fit mostly physically there. There was a little CGI to added later, but most of what we see are either two full-size mechanical puppets or two men wearing raptor suits for the shots requiring movement and agility. This meant that on set, just under the kids, there would be three operators with remote controls, another six operators underneath the cameras, and 12 operators hiding in the cupboards. And no matter how you map out that scene and each shot, this is not an easy process to control once you start shooting the type of scene that has a lot of running around. On one take, Joseph Mazzello, who is the actor who played the young boy, got whacked on the head really hard by a velociraptor claw when the crew lost control of the puppet and it accidentally went in the wrong direction. So surely, surely, a clean, controllable digital system would be better than harming your child actors. And that's kind of what they got. Um, I'm, not, I'm not going to go into the details too much, but briefly, early in production, two members of ILM's art department quietly made a proof of concept computer-generated animation of a T-Rex, which demonstrated that technology was capable of delivering convincing computer-generated images of dinosaurs, and crucially, more convincing than stop-frame animation. Spielberg and his producers made the decision to hand over the work intended for the stop-frame folks to the digital team. Although in the final cut there was only around 15 minutes of CGI, the film's innovation was not showing dinosaurs, but demonstrating that CGI could be convincing. And the CGI team were not simply left alone with their computers to figure out how dinosaurs behaved and moved, but instead they worked alongside the stop-frame animators and modelers, led by Phil Tippett, whose extensive research for the film was now put to use to support computer animation. 
This included the dinosaur input device, essentially a tiny model similar to those used in stop frame, which could be used to record movements in the hardware that could then be translated onto a wireframe animation on the computer. And thinking physically and contextually was a crucial part of this process. Phil Tip had also directed the animators through pantomime and physical performance, saying it helps, to, it helps them to cut out a lot of the needless hard, hard work by first blocking out all the shots using their own bodies. Classes were intended to break the cycle that some people have of not wanting to use their bodies and just wanting to talk through shots or be cerebral. But what about the actors, the actual actors who had been hired specifically to use their bodies and their faces and remember, they'd been originally hired to act on set alongside large, physically present, reasonably realistic things, and were now being asked to act equally convincingly with a blank space. Obviously, they did a good job. That's their job. The visual effects lead, Dennis Murren, said, they're actors. They know where to look when there's nothing. But what did it feel like to have to do that? Not easy. Joseph Mazzello, the young actor who played Timmy, recalled. For a long time, I was upset because I didn't get to see any dinosaurs. We were running around in Hawaii with a Gallimimus that was supposed to be running past us that were computer animated. I remember one scene where the T-Rex comes out of the wood, snatches one up and eats it. What I got to look at was this wooden stick with a dinosaur head drawn on top of it, which I, as a nine-year-old, could have drawn, <laughs> and a couple of guys moving it around and Steven Spielberg screaming at me into a megaphone, OK, he's eating him, Joe. He's eating him now. You're looking at him. He's eating him. Not easy. <laughs> In Act 2, we continue to develop the story and the conflict. There is rising tension. The characters and the audience are no longer in their comfort zone. So Jurassic Park was a phenomenal success, transforming a film into a franchise. There were five further films that were made. The Lost World, Jurassic Park, Jurassic Park 3, Jurassic World, Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, and Jurassic Park, Jurassic World, sorry, Dominion. And whilst all of those films, like the original, combined CGI with complex animatronics, the use of digital effects elsewhere went into overdrive. But not just in movie theatres. Digital wireless and smart systems have also unfurled into the world, and connectivity and computational capacity are in far more places now than they were 30 years ago. Characters in the later Jurassic films now have mobile phones, the internet, the wireless internet, smartphones, and so do the audience, who have all of this and more, living in a new world of algorithms, big data. On it goes. Software may not have eaten the entire world, but it has given it a good chew. Actors on set now might be acting against green screens and yelling at tennis, tennis balls on sticks, but when the lights in the theatre go up, the audience switch on their phones and go to work the next day and live their lives and also have to contend with something which is all around them but is also not really there. So let's back up a little. Jurassic Park came out in 93, and by 1996, the early internet had started to slide into the world. At the World Economic Forum that year, the cyber libertarian John Perry Barlow gave a speech, Declaration of the Independence of Cyberspace, which is roughly what it sounds like. The speech opens. Governments of the industrial world, you weary giants of flesh and steel, I come from cyberspace, the new home of the mind. You can, you can see what he's doing. In the speech, he makes the case that the internet can't be controlled by the state in the same way as older traditional industries like steel or construction, because it has no materiality. He carries on. Your legal concepts of property, expansion, identity movement, and context do not apply to us. They are all based on matter, and there is no matter here. Which is fighting talk. Looking back, you can see, you can feel this familiar idea that an immaterial form of information flow and structure is more real and more important than the material world it acts through. 
All of this is well before smartphones or the Internet of Things or smart fridges or big data or algorithmic management or platform capitalism or doing your banking with your phone or meeting your boyfriend and or girlfriend on your phone. But that is all coming down the pipeline. And even at this point in the mid 90s, cyberspace is something peculiar, a strange juxtaposition of a million different virtual worlds but ones which could only be accessed through physical screens housed in machines and operating in bedrooms and offices and so on. And when wireless and smart technologies came along and the power of your computer was in your pocket and maybe now even your boss, these frictions became weirder. As the media scholar Shannon Matten writes, this ostensibly wireless networkedness constitutes nothing less than a new human experience. Connectivity is neither as untethered nor as ethereal as Wi-Fi implies. What we do with these systems may seem to be profoundly mundane. Ordering food, paying bills, talking to friends, having a meeting, doing some work, applying for a job. And I know all of this sounds like the copy for an advert for Microsoft in 2003, but the way that these mundane things now happen are really strange, kind of cuddled into a big cozy nest of digital infrastructure and purpose which seems to be everywhere, seeping into every last bit of life, whilst at the same time asking you to just carry on as normal. For the philosopher Timothy Morton, something like the internet and its sister digital infrastructures are what he describes as hyper-objects. They are difficult to approach, they are hard to conceptualize, they exist far beyond the human scale and lifespan. Instead, we can only feel them out as strange things that we grasp at as they pass through our limited human consciousness. And I do, I do think something about this approach works. It's embodied, it recognizes the human scale and size and lifespan. You know, and these systems, these digital systems, which we'll be talking about a lot in the next day or so, they are enormous and complex and sometimes confusing and impenetrable. But, but this way of thinking positions digital systems as far beyond human perception and control, which in turn implies you don't have to really worry about them um, or engage with their larger consequences, like they're happening out there, we're over here, maybe eating crisps, and sometimes we will bump into each other. But what if you yourself are directly involved in these systems? The digital realm is needy. All of these things require people to build and operate them. And you might think that you're involved in building an enormous structure, that you'd have some awareness of the wholeness of it. Maybe like the animators in Jurassic Park, you would be working on, in an interdisciplinary team to consider the context, the form, the feel and interactions of what this is that you're making to give a full holistic sense of what the complex thing is or not. AI image training is one of those system building jobs. It is comparatively new. It involves receiving images from a client and then tagging and annotating the objects in that image. It is mostly repetitive and simple desk work, though it does require precision and focus. It is outsourced. This work isn't usually done by the companies building the software or steering it into purpose, and who are often, but not always, based in San Francisco. But it is predominantly done by far lower paid workers, agents, far away in the Philippines, Colombia, Nairobi, and more. And as writer Matamita Mergia says of her investigations into these jobs, often workers may not even know who their client is or what type of algorithmic system they are working on. People cannot see what they are building. The problem is not that this system is too big and complicated to comprehend, but intentionally it is kept concealed. This is the disaggregated logic of the supply chain. The work and the workers are separated from each other and from the organizations which they are then ultimately working for. Non-disclosure agreements isolate them, preventing the agents from having direct contact with their clients or from even disclosing their clients' names. And here, a technology like AI is not overwhelming. It is, as Merger describes it, disjointed. Image training work is compacted into a series of small, mundane, and often manageable tasks. By design, this does not allow the agent, the worker, to comprehend or experience the larger system that they are building. But what happens if the technological system exerts control over you? What if it might even be a threat? 
In algorithmic management, managerial functions are handed over to a complex technological algorithmic system. These are things like job allocation, benchmarks, wages, surveillance of work and workers, fraud detection, facial recognition, behavior profiling, sentiment profiling, recommendations of whether to hire or fire workers, and a bunch more. This is a system which sees the workplace and the people in it as something to impose its patterns onto. Food delivery gig workers who work for providers including Uber Eats, Deliveroo, DoorDash, and Delivery Worker are subject to this type of control. And like image tagging, this is work which involves a series of repeating tasks. You select an order, pick up food, deliver food, repeat. But this is profoundly physical work which involves cycling or driving at speed in all weather conditions, actual, under actual rain, no rain, rain machines here, across uncertain terrains in order to deliver enough orders per hour to make a living wage. The workers know that their working days and nights are choreographed and controlled algorithmically, and they know that again, by the system's design, they are intentionally separated from other workers and incentivized to compete aggressively for orders. They know that they must ride or drive dangerously to make bank. But other parts of the system are kept intentionally opaque. Workers have no access to the calculations made by the machine learning systems that dictate their work, and these rules are changeable and can be rewritten each day by another tranche of fresh data. In his essay, Long Days, Longer Battles, the labor rights scholar Cullum Kant describes how in London, delivery workers have seen the amount that they are paid for each delivery go down, but no one knows the details of why. So the workers, he writes, measure falling pay in their own specific ways. They have become reliant on cheap, frozen meals. They no longer have the cash spare to cover emergency repairs. They are working more hours per day to make the same amount. They know what it is like to keep riding when you are soaking wet and exhausted, what it's like to have a close call with a bus, and to say a silent prayer of thanks that you didn't go under the wheels. They know that digital patterns overflow onto their analog bodies, and they know that because they can feel it. But again, they don't know why. Matamita Mergia writes about an Uber driver in London whose account was suddenly stopped for no reason. And when he was finally able to get through to Uber to ask why this has happened, they said over and over, the system can't be wrong. What have you done? And he said, I said, that's why I'm calling you. And this is where the presence of complex systems becomes weird. And I think, I think that weird is, in a way, more uncertainly and differently dangerous, because it makes the world more unstable and your experience in it less trustworthy. In her book, Doppelganger, Naomi Klein traces out what happens when a digital pattern becomes strange in the world. Klein had her own personalized, hyper-realistic special effect, a chaotic double, Naomi Wolf. Wolf, who started out as a journalist and writer and then morphed into what we might call a conspiracy theorist, using her platform to promote misinformation about a lot of things, but including technology, including claims that 5G networks were affecting air quality. What Naomi Klein was interested in was why Naomi Wolf's deeply paranoid stories had spread so far, despite being easily disprovable. And what she had concluded was that conspiracy theories around technology had struck a chord with the public, tapping into real fears. Klein writes, it was as though Naomi Wolf had taken everyone's cumulative tech terrors, bundled them all together, and then projected them onto benign technical systems. The words that Wolf was saying were essentially fantasy, but emotionally, to the many people listening to her, they clearly felt true. And the reason they felt true is that we are indeed living through a revolution in surveillance tech and state and corporate actors who have indeed seized outrageous powers to monitor us, often in collaboration and coordination. And moreover, as a culture, we have barely begun to reckon with the transformational nature of this shift. Klein argues there's this strange doubling of conspiracy theories which are factually false but emotionally resonant are ways of not seeing. They are a slippage between what we experience and what we understand that to be and how we come to that understanding. And when it is hard or harder to see structural, economic, political forces that undergird te complex technologies that may act in ways that are not benign, it is easier, Klein implies, to rely on people and stories that offer a simpler and darker explanation to tell us what we are looking at. Once CGI was introduced into the production of Jurassic Park, there was never any question, as I've said, about whether the human actors were able, under instruction, to see and feel what wasn't there and deliver convincing performances despite the lack of actual dinosaurs. But the set wasn't empty. 
There was something there, the crew and the director. And in order to do their job, the actors had to sever and deny their experience of what was around them and overlay it with what wasn't around them, which they then had to convince and perform was real. As Sam Neill, who played Dr. Alan Grant, recalls, Steven Spielberg was holding a bullhorn and roaring into it like a dinosaur in a not very convincing way. It is difficult enough acting to a tennis ball, but it is even harder when you are trying not to laugh. <laughs> Act three marks the end. We reach the final conflict where the hero vanquishes their nemesis and everyone gets what they deserve, which is hopefully a happy ending. Which is very predetermined. Almost like imposing a pattern onto a mess. The way that we have conditioned to expect stories to take place in a neat, linear, consequential manner is unnatural. Things just keep on happening. There is a seventh Jurassic Park movie being shot right now, and it will never end. <laughs> but in the midst of where we are now, there are maybe things we can do. When I saw Jurassic Park for the first time, all those years ago, it was in a movie theater. I mean, not dissimilar to where we are today. Cinema is a collective experience. Everyone is scared together in the dark. Your feelings dissolve out into the crowd, and the audience's fear and excitement diffuse right back into you until you are all yelling at the sight of a door handle being opened very slowly. When there is a collective, there is a possibility of collective experience. The food delivery workers, I mentioned, who work under the dictates of algorithms intended to maximize profit by any means possible under a digital pattern which se deliberately separates them from their peers, they still live here in the world. <laughs> like The workers themselves still exist, and they would meet each other in person. When they were waiting to pick up orders, they would see each other on the road. They have a shared experience, not identical to everyone else, not objective, but a subjective collective. And from collective experience, the gig workers built collective action, adding each other to WhatsApp groups and organizing collective strike action. Their demands are grounded by an understanding that the system of power that shapes their labor, it is there, it is designed, and it is intended to work a certain way, and that it can be changed. Even together, the scale of the delivery workers is dwarfed by the massive size of tech platforms. But the point of this type of collective action is to create a link between their work, which happens and is felt here, and the extractive system, which is there, and to give it a good shake. Not all of our experiences with complex technological systems happen in the workplace. The strike actions of platform workers are intended as part of a much longer strategy, both to improve pay, but also to draw public attention to their working conditions. So there is something else to take from this about how we can pay attention to these slippery infrastructures as they incur into our lives. To be aware of the parts and the whole, to ask collective and grounded questions about finding how they operate, who they affect and why, and then finding our own link to shake. It is a way of pushing back on the de facto orthodoxy that a digital system can be neatly imprinted onto the world and that systemic change is overwhelming and beyond us. Because, after all, if velociraptors can systematically test electrified fences for weakness, then so can we. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go stand okay. in the middle. Thank you, Georgina. I have so many thoughts. <laughs> I have so many thoughts. Um, so I'm going to start by going back to Jurassic Park. And <laughs> as someone who hosts a radio program about film music, what I can't stop thinking about is, and I never realized it, there's this huge tension in the Jurassic Park franchise in that these are ostensibly technology-critical stories. These are stories that are, are about... Uh, about our, our sort of hubris mm. in, in relation to this sort of techno-optimism. Um, but these films, and in particular the first one, and especially if you think about the music of John Williams, who is probably the greatest living film composer, and this is a hugely underrated score, 
One of the most beautiful pieces he has ever written is the music you hear the first time you get that wide shot of the dinosaurs in the landscape. And I'm sorry about my singing, but the, the theme, like this, it's called the science theme, popular. This music comes in, and I get goosebumps just thinking about the experience of seeing that for the first time. And that film was about the awe of science and technology. Mm. And that moment, we are meant yeah. to feel that it's beautiful. And I don't know, I have many like sub questions <laughs> to this, but my first vibe is like, is that wrong? <laughs> Science is also beautiful. <laughs> Technology can also be beautiful. And we have experiences with that film, for instance, mm. that are awe inspiring. The question is, I, I know, no, that's fine. It's, it's, you know, it is the, it's a large scale movie. It's working deliberately with, you know, awe and the sublime and beautiful things. You know, it deliberately deploys music in a way that I think is really interesting. The sound design of the film from the score to the animal noises is astonishing. Um, but it does that as a kind of way of kind of steering, steering emotions so that by the time you, you, you know, you start from a point of being like, this is great. And by the time it's all going horribly wrong, you've got kind of a downward slide rather than starting more suspiciously and being, I don't think this is great. It's like, no, it is. There is something impressive there. Um, I think this kind of this relationship between kind of what I mean. So there's, I mean, there's a much longer history in science and technology, and in with large structures generally of being encouraged to see large spectacular things and feel large spectacular things and have that kind of again very embodied feeling of. Um, seeing mountains or seeing, you know, the ocean, you know, like, oh my God, it is huge and beautiful and potentially dangerous. And like, it, it is a very specific, sublime, romantic reaction between the scale of your body, which is small, and the size of the thing, which is large and overwhelming. And that, that is something that's kind of also been played with by, well, technologists and engineers when they build large scale, you know, engineering projects um, to kind of say this, this thing is amazing, this huge bridge we've built, this gigantic building, it is like an astonishing feat. But it is also something that can be played with as well. There is something that I think, you know, that can be played with depending on how things are being, if, if I would say, how, if things are being steered, if you're being moved into a particular emotionally resonant place to react in a certain way to a thing or to build an association around something huge and spectacular, which isn't actually huge and spectacular, but you have that set up through the music cues, the lighting, the stage, you know, all the rest of it. Okay, so this is the feel <laughs> face of me like thinking in real time. But I'm, I'm, under, I'm realizing, yes, of course, I have this, I have similar emotions about like space travel. Like there are that kind of awe that goes into almost like the sacred and especially for in a mostly secular age, like engaging yeah. with these kinds of ideas of scientific progress, uh, you know, is all can be like a spiritual thing. But I think there has to be a difference. And that's, of mm -hmm. course, what you're telling us today. There's a difference between our feelings of awe and like some engineer thinking this would be pretty awesome. Like th there's like a different category error between these awesome because like the Silicon Valley dude bro who doesn't ask what is the cost, what are the consequences <laughs> if we build this thing that would be pretty cool, mm -hmm. is that's not the same. Like even if they manage to manipulate mm -hmm. me into feeling, actually I heard I heard an Amazon ad literally this morning that said, wow, like this yeah. package was delivered so fast <laughs> and I'm meant to feel this, feel this feeling of awe. But I don't, that doesn't work on me because I know how it works in the back end, right? I, 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 I okay, this is, this is just my mind melting now. Um, but then I, I guess the qu question is, how do we take, like how do we start to, to engage with these systems and like allow ourselves to be in like, like you know, mm -hmm. Humanity is awesome, progress is awesome, all these things. But to not be like bamboozled into thinking that all of these innovations are cool. Like, where do we begin? I think uh, having a big question at the start of it is a really good point. Um, I, to go back a little to what you were saying about these feelings of awe um, and like how that, and you know, your package has been delivered. And it's like, yes, that's what we're paying for. You know, this is not what's that exciting. It's like, can we just get this to me on time? Um, there is a kind of a difference, I think, between the front stage and the backstage, or the kind of the cell and the actuality. And the cell is necessarily very shiny. You've got you know, a very long history of, again, technologies or systems being sold in big, spectacular ways. That kind of, you can go back a century. You could look at things like world fairs, where you would get like huge, incredible kind of exhibits to be like electricity. <laughs> it's like, oh my god, and like, electri electricity is really exciting. You know, when you're like oracle systems, it's like. The thing doesn't, it doesn't, like, you're not having that same kind of effect. 
But there's a difference with all respect, and I love to Oracle systems. Anyway, we'll, we'll move on from that. Um, <laughs> But there is, again, the backstage of like, what, what is the thing, you know? I mean, a very, very little example, like we, we, this is beautiful, beautiful done, wonderful tech work, and you go around the back of the stage, and it's a dark room where there's the wiring, and there's all the kit waiting, and that it does its job, it necessarily does its job brilliantly, but that's not what's being presented here with us. Um, if you look at things like the building of the Golden Gate Bridge, which is one of the classic kind of sublime, amazing technologies, um, it's, you know, people would, I'd be overwhelmed by it because it's incredible, like architectural, it is incredible, an architectural engineering feat that gets you from one bit of San Francisco to another. It was a vastly violent and dangerous thing to build. A lot of work has died on that. You know, and this kind of this thing of the, the front is not the back, and the people at the front are not going to be having the same priorities as the people at the back. So what, what is this thing, and what, how is it manifesting, and how is it landing, I think is the, the first one. And the second question, which is almost the more existential one, if we want to go there, is why, why are we starting with technology as the fix in the first place? What is the thing? Why is there, an, is there I'm, an assumption of kind of a larger overarching thing that can be just applied to anything rather than finding other ways of doing it, seeing what's already there? Because if you're, again, I think the Tiga Brain quote of if you talk about systems, it implies the presence of an engineer. Why is that the best way? You know, it may be a way, but as this thing starts moving into the world and landing, it can be flattening, it can be something which doesn't take account of context, granularity, regions, n you know, the necessary differences. And of power. And who power. Is and in power. Front of exactly. the, who is from you know, yeah. who is who is the thing designed, who is it awesome for yeah. and who is backstage, yeah. right? Exactly, yeah. exactly. But and and where is it where is the imposition in that power? Because once they particularly well, particularly for large scale things, once they start rolling out and once dependencies start being built into them, it becomes very, very difficult to kind of reverse back from that. Yeah. Um, I think one of the smaller examples I had with, I don't know if the guys are here, but who I was chatting to folks last night at the drinks and the dinner, we were talking about, you know, phone banking. Yeah, it's, it's small, it's mundane and it works, but what does that mean when the actual banks start closing and you don't have a physical place to go to? These things, that relationship, um, that steamrollering of the, like, if we don't get on this thing in time, what is that leaving behind us? And like, and who is benefiting from it really? Yeah, and are you replacing systems? Mm. And, and also, of course, because of this like dis disruption structures, where it's like, oh, no, no, this is much more cheaper yeah. and efficient. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's cheaper and efficient until you forced everybody else out of the market. If anybody's yeah. taken an Uber in the last few years, you know what I'm talking yeah. about. Like, it's no. So then you have all the shitness and no improvement, but you also yeah. lost everything. Like, yeah. yeah, everything and you fought for I mean, for I a century. To, to bring it back to Jurassic Park, um, one of the things... <laughs> Um, one of the things I really like about it, which it is different from the film and the book, is that the film, the park is unfinished. Like, it's very clearly unfinished. Yeah, you get this bits, there's like the clear plastic sheets that are laying over things. The computer science, uh, the, the IT specialists are like struggling to kind of, oh, but literally to keep things online. Like bits of rides work and don't work. You know, the dinosaurs are hiding until they're not. And still it's being sold as like, just, just wait for us to get it right. And it's just like the idea that like it will not be made right is not really on the table. It's like we've built at least half of it. We've got that investment into this thing. We've made sufficient differences to make this to, to do this work. Are, are you not entertained? You know, hmm. why why are you not happy about the dangerous dinosaur park? And why you know? are you asking all these questions? Why are you about asking all these difficult this questions? Stuff is like exactly, yeah. we built yeah. this dinosaur, and you're like, mm, you know. Can you control the dinosaur? I feel like this yeah. is like one the whole last year of AI conversation. <laughs> and they're like, well, no, but it's not going to be a problem because it's totally within this fence. I mean, I think also... <laughs> I've seen this movie, you know? <laughs> have, have you built the dinosaur? Have you still got your needle deep in that chunk of amber? Like, that's also the backup question as well. Yeah. Oh my God, I didn't realize this is so profound, <laughs> but it's pretty profound. I'm going to spend the rest of, you know, like my life thinking about this movie this way now. Do we have an, uh, we have time for one or, or a few questions from the audience, if, if anyone has one on your mind? Uh, There's a question right here. Do we, can we get a microphone over there? You could please wave uh, with your blue shirt, wave. Yeah. So we can find you. Yes, yeah. there? Yes. Um, I have to say, this is one of the most inspiring presentations I've been to, and I've been to an awful lot of presentations. <laughs> um, so thank you. I'm interested in how this translates across to Westworld. Ooh. 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 I haven't spent the past three weeks watching Westworld, so I'm not sure I'm going to be able to give you an easy answer. Um, 
I think it's just trying to remember. There's the original Westworld, and there's the most recent series as well. Um, you still, I mean, so you still have common themes here of kind of if you engineer this thing, it will, you know, and you have an entertainment park where the animatronics run amok, but have more agency, I think, than they do with. T um, with Jurassic Park, where it's implied it's, well, it is much more an, an animalistic trying to eat things. Um, I think what's interesting about um, West, a lot of this stuff that's interesting around Westworld, Westworld brings out the gender dynamics much more strongly in terms of kind of what is being built and who is being built for and who is being entertained and how are they being entertained. And I think that wasn't so much there in the original, but in the 1970s one, but the recent television series have obviously very leaned very, very hard into that. Um, and I think there's also, I'm trying to try remember the plot of it. I think there's something interesting about the idea of luxury that comes with that. If you can, if you can pay for this thing, then you will be amply rewarded. But if you, if you can't afford it, then you don't get it. And there's kind of this separation out with the kind of, we will build this thing at any cost for the highest, for um, the highest buyer, um, the highest consumer. But that doesn't necessarily, that's, this is not something for everyone. There's still, I mean, a lot of the kind of things of, of unknown consequences, emergent categories, um, all those things are still very heavily built into it. Um, but I think because it's more dealing with hu human, human or human, humanoid, there's more that question of the imposition of an idea of who, who is human to us? You know, yeah. what, what tasks are they going to perform for Who's us? Humanity and counts yeah, exactly. too, right? Yes, yeah. exactly. Which um, is weird because now I haven't seen White Lotus, but now I'm starting to think maybe it's White Lotus, just the exact same show as Westworld. Like again, whose humanity counts yeah. when you go to like a luxury resort and do violence? Yes. You know? Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> this is like, we're going to need one of those, like, you know, those conspiracy boards yeah. with red string. I, but I, I, actually, <laughs> it's not a con conspiracy if we've just seen through the matrix. Yeah. Uh, right. Let's do another one. Over there. Thank you. Um, the, the, to go back to the Jurassic uh, Park, I realize yes. it's an analogy, but I think it's often presented as sort of the hubris of uh, scientists, but the, we're seeing scientists be able to extract uh, from a tiny insect and create an entire park uh, full of animals. Uh, we see uh, uh, Dennis Nedry, for example, able to sort of maintain hugely complicated systems despite clearly being underpaid and, and, and understaffed. Is the uh, hubris not more of the billionaire owners uh, here rather than the individual scientists who seem themselves to create uh, something marvelous? And it's money talks at the end. Oh, no, absolutely. I mean, the film starts with. Um the paleontologist being very unsure whether this, this is any of this is a good idea, and then being told the next three years of their grant are paid for, and then they go off to the park. So there's definitely, <laughs> seriously, I mean, yes. th this, <laughs> this is the academic grant system in process. Um, <laughs> But there's definitely the element of kind of like what is steering this thing, and I think this kind of touches on a much larger question of where responsibility lies through all of this. Of does it all land with John Hammond and the and his lawyers and his financiers at the top, and everyone else is just doing their job? But I kind of uh, that kind of again denies agency, and it also implies a kind of a closed offness to both the scientists, the scientists, and the geneticists who are do, who are doing the work which does work, um, and also, but are they able to think about the larger consequences of what they are doing? I mean, simul simultaneously, you could argue with the, um, the IT leads, they are underpaid, but obviously one of them is about to steal embryos to kind of get that money back again. So there, I think I'm not comfortable with like, there is the steerage of a large system like this, but I'm also not comfortable with like the absconding responsibility or ex ex absconding awareness from further down the chain as well. This is, yeah. And there's also, isn't, I mean, I know I'm, it's, I, I, I won't, I've seen this like in the last two years, but I still can't quite, but I feel like when the scientists come to the park, when we see it through their eyes, one of the first things that they go is like, well, like you've done some amazing science like yeah, yeah, here, yeah. but you have not thought about the ecosystem stuff right, exactly. at all. Like, so this is also about, about that. And what's the Jeff Goldblum quote about? Uh, it's life uh, finds a way. Life finds, finds a way. way. Yeah, right. Cause so, like, it's also about nature. Yeah finds a way, but, but that's think, the yeah. hubris, like the poster almost. But I think, I mean, to kind of bring in the front stage and the backstage again to that question, the question about responsibility, um, and the question about, you know, the, do you not realize that your plants are poisonous? There is this kind of this very lack of interdisciplinary, responsible, holistic thinking of thinking about how this will all act and link together, as opposed to these kind of silos of these things that are acting and then can be steered more clearly in a different way. And again, with the back, you know, with the backstage, with the production of it, with the early work that did bring together model makers, you know, physical model makers, 
puppeteers, um, performance artists, the people who are building the CGI, and getting them to work together to think about how are you going to manifest something that has weight and presence and liveness and uncertainty, rather than just assuming that, you know, once we've, you know, they built a huge amount of new software for this film, but assuming that once you just, like, jack it into the, the engine, the thing will be made and it will look great without dealing yeah, with, with the uncertainty and the complexities that come with that. So putting uh, all of this now in the context of all the talks we have heard and, and will heard today, what strikes me is that, that it's important that we don't have this narrative that there's some kind of natural state of nature that would be like the alternative. Maybe we could imagine such a thing, but it's completely theoretical. We, we don't, certainly don't have that anymore. Like we have already built Jurassic Park. And to survive, we're going to have to continue living in Jurassic Park, and we're going to have to deal with like some of our earlier choices. And th so there's something on that level as well, like moving into mm. the future, we're going to have to solve problems with technology. And I don't know, again, like, who, well, well, let's th put it this way. Who do you identify with in the film? Because like, <laughs> is that maybe it? Maybe your answer to which movie you Jurassic Park is for you is like, who do you identify with? As a kid, it was the kids. Yeah. But now I'm thinking Laura Dern. Laura Dern probably is the one yeah. who is impressed, but it's also right from the, um, the beginning, um, being like, you haven't thought about this. And yeah. also, crucially, Laura Dern, who is not afraid to get her hands dirty <laughs> as well. Um, yeah, and Laura Dern, who is, yeah, who is, whose um, authority is, is overlooked um, as the woman of the film as well. Yeah. Yeah, I, we could talk about this for hours. <laughs> uh, of course, we, we cannot. Uh, so I'm really happy to say that you're going to be in the pop-up library during the long break in the afternoon, so you can continue yeah. talking about this there. I'm going to give you some housekeeping information, but I will just say about the pop-up library that, of course, there you will also be able to touch and look at and figure out how to get your hands on Systems Ultra, this beautiful book, and many other books uh, from our speakers today. Please give a huge hand to Georgina Voss. <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, you so much. Yeah, you can do it. Okay.